people on television and in movies attract attention everywhere they go, but not all of the attention is welcome. Tragically, a television reporter in Michigan was killed outside her home after she received numerous threatening letters. A document examiner, a criminal profiler, and the police dog all found evidence pointing to the same suspect. But the most persuasive evidence came from the dog. King found everything she was looking for in Battle Creek, Michigan. We must do all in our power to support our men and women now fighting in the Middle East, knowing that... She was a news reporter for the local television station, had a nice home, was married, and had two beautiful children. Diane Newton King was the kind of woman that when she walked into a room, eyes turned to look at her. Not only because of the way she looked with her attractive Native American looks, but she was the type of woman who always had a smile on her face, was very animated, and uh, people's eyes were just naturally drawn toward her. Three and a half years in a Japanese prisoner of war camp. Diane had a reputation as a tough, aggressive reporter. She would push. I mean, to get a story, she would push. And sometimes maybe she'd push hard. Although Diane caught the viewer's attention, it wasn't always in the way she wanted. She started receiving harassing phone calls and letters from an obsessed fan. It was a man who identified himself as a person who wanted to get in the industry and wanted to go to lunch with her and wanted to meet her. And he began pestering her, sometimes calling as much as uh, once a day. Station executives hired an additional security guard and screened all of Diane's calls. Diane's husband, Brad, a former policeman, took precautions of his own. They put in security lights, automatic lights that would come on when someone would come into the yard. The sister uh, gave them a Doberman pincher that was used as a watchdog. But the harassment continued, including this letter sent to her home. The words created by letters cut from magazines said, you should have gone to lunch with me. That's when things begin to get very scary is when they found the first letter in her mailbox, because before, no one knew where she lived. Diane gave the letter to local police. I have never found one case where a stranger cut letters out and put it on a sheet of paper. You see it on TV, you see it in the movies, but you don't see that in real life. A few weeks later, Someone broke into the king's home while the family was away, but nothing was stolen. These bizarre incidents culminated in tragedy one Saturday afternoon in 1991. Diane's husband, Brad, came home and found Diane lying in the driveway, dead of an apparent gunshot wound to the chest. Their two children were still inside the car, alive but frightened. The police were concerned that they may have been partially responsible. One of the detectives called that night to the murder scene. His first reaction was, oh my god, we've screwed up. He was worried that the, the letter had languished on his desk for a couple of months and he hadn't really done any serious investigation on it. There were several clues in that letter, but not the kind police expected. Diane King's murder was front page news in the small town of Battle Creek. Investigators hoped to find some clues during the autopsy. And it revealed something telling. Diane King had been shot not once, but twice with a 22 caliber rifle. The angle of the shot to the chest was slightly downward. That is, as it passed from front to back, it passed slightly downward, indicating that the weapon uh, was slightly above her when fired. The second shot followed a completely different trajectory. The 
The second one was most unusual. This wound entered just above the pubic bone and passed very sharply upward. That is, it passed uh, through some of the intestines, through the left lung, and I recovered that bullet next to the left collarbone. Apparently, the killer fired once from above, and then he moved closer and lower before he fired again. He or she would have to be either kneeling or perhaps prone on the ground, holding the weapon essentially parallel or almost parallel to the ground. At the crime scene, investigators identified the possible location of the shooter. In the hayloft of the barn next to the driveway was a single 22 caliber shell casing. I kind of sent goosebumps up my back to know that we were that close, perhaps, to whoever had committed this crime. I mean, we were standing right in the same place that he had stood probably within the hour. With police personnel helping to recreate the crime, investigators used a laser to confirm this was the sniper's nest. We knew what the angle of the uh, trajectory in the body was from the autopsy. And we tried to determine if that was consistent with having been shot from the loft of the barn. And by directing the laser beam from the loft to where the victim stood, we were able to say that of uh, that angle was consistent. Next, Michigan State Trooper Gary Lyle and his tracking dog, Travis, tried to pick up the killer's scent. The shell casing of any weapon ejects to the right when it's fired. So I moved to the left side of the shell casing, and Travis indicated that he had a track at that point, and we started from that point. Dogs can track someone by his scent, which is unique combination of dead skin cells that fall, plus perspiration. The adrenaline flows, their heart pumps faster, they sweat, they get excited. It's a whole different odor than a person that's, uh, say, confused, um, or a person that, that's lost. Travis followed the scent from the sniper's nest in the barn, across a small footbridge, over a creek, and then took a sharp left turn. Travis brought the track up to here. And this is where Travis got really excited. Here, they found the exposed end of a 22 caliber Remington Scoremaster 511 rifle that had been jammed into the mud. In the water nearby were seven spent shell cartridges. Everybody was pretty excited because they knew that probably wasn't a murder weapon because there'd be no other reason for anyone else to stick something like that into a, a creek bed at that particular time. At the crime lab, ballistic experts test-fired the rifle, giving them its fingerprint, a unique mark on the bottom of each shell created by the rifle's firing pin. The fired cartridge case that was recovered from the loft of the barn and the seven cartridge cases from the uh, creek were identified as all having been extracted by the firearm in question but it was impossible to match the bullets to the rifle. And the reason for that was the condition of the bullets. They were damaged from impacting with a, with a target, the body in, in this case, and it made it difficult to make any uh, positive determination. Back at the crime scene, Travis wasn't yet finished with his investigation. After finding the rifle and the shell casings, he jumped the stream and picked up the killer scent once again. It's just amazing what the dog's scent ability is, and you just wonder how in the world they can do this and find things that they find. Travis followed the scent into the woods, out into the street, then, surprisingly, back to the crime scene. If Travis was correct, the killer was one of the bystanders watching as police conducted their investigation. Shortly after Diane King's funeral, her mother gave police an important piece of information about the murder, something Brad King failed to mention. The original plan was that Diane was going to leave her two children with her mother and then come back to be with Brad that weekend so the two of them had some time together alone. But on February 9th, 
And apparently because one of the children wasn't feeling too well, Diane decided to take the kids with her and make the two hour trip back to Marshall, Michigan. We have a victim who gets out of her car. Uh, we don't have any evidence that would suggest that she was afraid of anything. She did not take any kind of defensive action. And we have an offender who not only is comfortable in the crime scene, he's also comfortable walking up to the victim and shooting her again. Brad King was a part-time college professor teaching criminology, and he didn't have a solid alibi. Brad told investigators he was out walking in the woods behind his home and showed investigators where he'd been. But Travis, the police dog, identified this same area as the killer's getaway route. He showed that he would have had to have seen anybody come his way and run down to the track where the dog took, and he would have seen anybody commit that crime coming from the barn. And of course, that was never brought up. Brad denied owning a 22 caliber rifle. However, in his home were 22 caliber bullets similar but not identical to the brand used in the murder. There was also a cleaning rod for a 22 caliber rifle. We had the two cleaning ladies come forward who claimed to have seen a similar rifle on the bar in the basement of a um, townhouse that the Kings rented here in the city of Battle Creek. I can recall seeing it every time we was there. It was a 22 rifle. Police found another inconsistency in the case of the attempted burglary of the King's home a few weeks before the murder. As everybody knows who watches uh, any kind of television show, that if you're breaking in to a house, the glass should be on the inside. In this case, the glass was on the outside. So whoever broke it had to be inside at the time that the window was broken. Next, investigators turned their attention to the threatening letter mailed to Diane's home. Statistically, only 1% of all threatening letters have cut out pieces. One of the most telling aspects of this crime, and that was one where the letters were cut out of a magazine and pasted onto a blank sheet of paper. I have, in my career, never seen a letter like that where it wasn't somebody emotionally close to the victim. A perpetrator uses cutout letters when the victim would be able to identify his handwriting. Unfortunately, by the time the letter was sent to the FBI for analysis, there was no hope of finding any fingerprints. The anonymous note had been processed by the originating agency with a powder. And in my opinion, that's not the correct process to use. And it's very difficult, once it's been processed with a powder, to do any other chemical process on the document. I had the office of Brad King at Western Michigan University uh, searched with a search warrant and items seized. I wanted scissors, uh, razor blades, tape, paste, anything, paper, anything that we might be able to link through forensic science to Bradford King. We were unable to do that. In terms of motive, police found evidence of spousal abuse, sexual affairs, and Diane's overall dissatisfaction with her husband's lifestyle. She came in uh, one morning, and she, she was crying, and she had bruises. She showed me the bruises, and this was right around Christmas time. And she said that her and Brad had been in a fight. Brad's a very different individual. I think he can have people like him real quick and also have him turned off real quick, just by his mood. And friends say Diane wanted Brad to get a full-time job. Well, Brad had the perfect setup. He was working part-time as an instructor at Western Michigan University. I think she was pushing that issue so much that he feared that he was not going to um, be able to continue his lifestyle he had at the university. His wife was responsible for taking care of the kids and getting the money, and I think she was angry at him because he wasn't uh, carrying his load. She was known to order him around and, and to yell at him, and I think it just reached a, 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 a crisis point uh, with him. 
and uh, he lashed out at her in this very passive-aggressive manner uh, by murdering her. Brad's alleged sexual affairs were with students from the college where he taught. He was not faithful to his wife. He had an, an affair with a student in one of his classes, he had an affair with another woman that he had met in Battle Creek. He was known to be trying to procure women girlfriends, uh, sometimes uh, at the fraternity house uh, that he used to hang out at uh, with younger fraternity members. It was not a picture of fidelity by uh, any stretch of the imagination. One year after his wife's death, Bradford King was arrested and charged with murder. The prosecutor and the investigators in this case were worried that because the suspect was a former police officer and a criminal injustice instructor at a major university, was going to spring something on them that was playing some kind of mind game with them, a kind of a forensic cat and mouse game. And sure enough, a new piece of evidence surfaced, threatening the prosecutor's case. Just as Bradford King was about to go on trial for the murder of his wife, Diane, prosecutors were dealt a serious setback. A man moving into the King's neighborhood said he found a Remington 511 Scoremaster rifle in his attic. It was virtually identical to the alleged murder weapon. The second rifle was sent to the forensic lab for testing. But the ballistic tests on the second gun showed that the shell casing found in the loft could have not have possibly come from the gun, uh, the second gun that was accumulated by police. Prosecutors believe Brad planted this rifle in a vacant home nearby to create reasonable doubt in the jury's mind and that it was Brad who made the threatening calls, sent the threatening letter, and staged the burglary, making the mistake of breaking the window from the inside rather than the outside. On the day of the murder, Diane planned to take the children to their grandparents' house to spend the night. While she was gone, Brad test-fired his rifle to align the sight and carefully collected the empty shell casings. Later, when Diane came home, Brad was waiting in the loft. His second shot was at close range after he left the barn a clear sign of hatred and anger. Then Brad realized the children were in the car, not knowing one of them was sick. Since he couldn't leave his small children in the cold for very long, he needed to change plans. So he quickly disposed of the rifle near the creek, threw the empty shells in the water, then went back to the house to call police. But Brad left one shell casing behind in the loft and this shell casing tied his rifle to the murder. And he was unaware that a police dog would track his scent from the sniper's nest to the creek, into the woods, then full circle back to his house. I think he had that foreknowledge that this was sort of a small town police operation and being the criminal injustice a criminal justice instructor and the type of individual he was, that I felt that he thought that he could outwit them. Many believe the children foiled his plan to establish a solid alibi. I don't believe he anticipated the children would be there. I think it's likely that he would have gone someplace else and had somebody else find his wife. That would give him an alibi. Diane told friends shortly before her death that she suspected Brad was behind the threatening calls and letters. And she said, I just think it's Brad. And she said, I, I don't know what I'm going to do yet. The defense presented only seven witnesses, arguing that the case against Brad was circumstantial. No one will get on the stand and say Brad King had a gun that day. Brad King held a gun that day. He pulled a trigger that day. Nobody. I was confident in my own mind that Brad King was guilty. I just didn't know if I could convince 12 people of that. 
the jury felt the forensic evidence was just as revealing, if not more so, than any eyewitness. We're the jury. Brad King was sentenced to life in prison without parole. When I'm looking at evidence, firearms evidence or other types of evidence, and I can make an identification, a positive identification that is helpful to the investigation, it's a good feeling when that can be done. All of the forensic science fit together and pointed in the direction of Brad King being the murderer of his wife. You may assume or may suspect that, that a particular person was involved, but without those sciences to tie them together for you, you have no case. I don't think we touch what a dog's nose can do. Every day I see them do things that would just, uh, you just, you just stand back and say, how could they?